Hello, everybody. There we go. There you go. Um, hey, guys. Uh, Eli Weiss. Um, I'm excited to have John here. John, if you want to start, maybe give a little bit about who you are, what you do, and then we'll, we'll kick off and talk about retention. All right. Who the heck am I? So um, I am, I think, one of the older people here in this room. It's nice to see all the you know, faces. <laughs> Uh, a little bit of experience in the beauty space, uh, D to C. Uh, started off uh, my e-commerce career with a little brand called Urban Decay Cosmetics back in the day um, before the acquisition by L'Oreal. Um, kind of got, uh, earned my chops there, running uh, their website and loyalty program. Uh, moved to um, a then fairly unknown brand called Drunk Elephant in a skincare space and was the first digital employee. Uh, kind of that uh, hockey stick moment for that brand where it became obvious like, hey, we need to get serious about this. Uh, and took that through the Shiseido acquisition that you may have heard of a couple years ago. Uh, and then it is, has become my pattern, got bored with the corporate life and uh, moved to a little brand called uh, Shawnee Darden Skincare based here in um, Beverly Hills and just recently went to Say, which is a sustainable, clean, uh, color cosmetics brand. Do you wanna, well, first of all, insanely stacked resume. Um, <laughs> six I months ago, oh yeah, six <laughs> months ago, we probably wouldn't be in the same room because we'd be competitors. Right, uh, right. So this is fun, it feels, it feels nice to switch from the beauty side back to, well not back, but to a different side, so now we can have these conversations. Uh, do you want to give like a ballpark how, how large uh, Say is? Yes, so um, we are going to cross that nine figure um, mark this year uh, and super excited about it. It's kind of like just had literally yesterday that moment uh, with the ops team where we're, we were literally like jumping up and down because our cost of goods is gonna come down. We've like hit that, <laughs> that moment where we can do enough volume to really get those cost savings. Congrats, so that's where we are. congrats. Um, we, we shared the same warehouse. That's the closest we got mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> in the last couple <laughs> of years. But uh, I, I think what's fun and interesting about this uh, chat we're having is you'll, you'll see t five, 10, 15 conversations about growth and obviously growth is super important, but. LTV uh, is a word that's coming up. It's suddenly hot again. Uh, it feels like retention is, is now a topic. Mm -hmm. Obviously, CX is like, you know, I, I've been doing this for, <laughs> for a decade. It's fun uh, that CX is a word people now know what it means. Uh, but, but I think what's, what's more interesting to me is as you go from, you know, both, both the brands that I was at and, and a lot of your experience is going from five, $10 million in revenue now going to 100. The, the, the entire game changes. And, and specifically about retention, um, retention entirely changes from when you're trying to get people to come back, when you have a list of 5,000 people to now, shit, I have two and a half million people on my email list, a couple hundred thousand on my, on my SMS list, how do I get people to come back? So I think maybe even just to start, we talk about how do you, how do you sit, you know, you're, you're VP digital, you're kind of leading all of that, how does your retention team sit? Mm -hmm. What does that look like day to day? How do you structure a business going in that, in that hockey stick route? Thanks, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I really have to be right there next to the founder um, and be an extension of her um, just vision. You know, it's not about me in the least, I'm just a cog in the wheel. Uh, and it's about making sure that the founder's vision and the branding is forward. Um, and for a brand like Say, I mean, same thing, Urban Decay and Drunk Elephant were very similar. Starting off with that core of that passionate consumer, like these are weird brands, right? I mean, who names a beauty brand Urban Decay, right? Or a skincare brand, you know, packaging it in clown colors and calling it drunk something, right? You know, people scoff at that. But you, you, you're tiny, you really spark the imagination of a small group of people who then become your real base. And that happened with Say in a, in, in a slightly different way. You know, here's this no makeup makeup clean brand, it's not flashy, it's not bizarre, you know, it's like back to basics. Um, and Lainey, our founder, started as an influencer herself and saw such an opportunity when she looked in her PR closet, like, hey, my clean makeup basket is empty, everything else is overflowing, there's an opportunity here, I don't know what to do, you know, but she had this core base of fans. and. 
That's where say comes from. She asked this core. They said what they wanted, and that's how we move forward. So um, that's kind of like the core that now, when you get to that next phase, like you're talking about, people think you're even bigger than you are, and it's like you don't have that cachet of, oh, I'm discovering this cool new thing. Now you have to play like a real beauty brand, and it gets a little more serious and a little more expensive. I love it. I, I think what's interesting to me is, you know, you start building out this team, you kind of, cr you, you, you crack the growth piece, you figure out how, how, to, how to run ads, you, you hear the word ROAS a bunch, you leave the room and you go to the retention team and you're like, okay, how do I, how do I get these people to buy again? How do I get them to buy the next thing? And say, kind of similar to Jones, you have a pretty wide skew assortment. How do you, how do you, and, and we'll get to CX because like, my Huge. universe is kind of how yeah. those two converge, but I want to talk about the retention side. Is you you crack the growth, suddenly say is is crushing. You're you're now a large brand. You're doing large brand stuff. How do you think about scaling retention mm -hmm. from the zero to the to the eight? Like how do you how do you structure the team? How do you think about email? Well, first, that's funny that you say I go to the retention team. Uh, <laughs> that's me. Um, so yeah, and it's still in the still the only digital employee, um, but I do have some consultants on the team that, uh, and that's just more of a say way of doing things, so not everyone's the same. But um, it really is taking a look across the spectrum, okay, where are all the touch points that we have? And, you know, have I had an experience, so, you know, I like to shop our own site, I like to interact um, with my team, where am I seeing something that makes me uncomfortable or cringe, like, and we address that. So, or an opportunity like, hey, SMS, you know, I feel like, you know, we haven't been giving this enough attention. So it can feel scattershot, but it really is methodically going through every touch point, finding those opportunities, and then developing a plan to attack it. I love that you go through the journey yourself. Uh, one of my favorite pastimes, and, and hi, I'm Eli, I'm Petty. Uh, one of my favorite pastimes is when anyone tweets about CX, I like to go and buy their product and then roll my eyes. Um, because you'd be shocked. I mean, like, A, the bar is very low, right? Like, providing a, an okay customer experience feels very silly, right? It's like, oh, just give them what they want. Mm -hmm. It's Reckon a transaction. It feels yeah. easy. Yeah. But, Kind of almost everyone fails on on building out a CX team that's meaningful, that's at all yeah. a competitive advantage. How do you think about, you know, you're the you're the retention person. How do you think about the CX side yeah. of the business? I mean, number one, that you have to have people on the team that are like family. I mean, that that's always been my experience in in all the brands. It hasn't been a hired team of gunslingers, right? It's like, I mean, almost exclusively, it's people who reached out to either the founder in the beginning and we're like there from uh, day one as just, I'll do anything to work for this brand and work for you and like, I'm so passionate about this. And it seems like impossible, but I mean, that's just the best way to do it. And then we find like-minded people and it just becomes easy and you treat them as the critical component of the whole process that they are um, and give them ownership to that. So. Uh, our CX teams always have, you know, they don't have to come to me except in the weirdest situations where it's almost more like, you're not going to believe this, I have to share this crazy thing with you, as opposed to, do I have permission, uh, or Sarah, like, to send the 28 pairs of shoes? It's like, yes, you do, you know, you know that's the right thing to do, do it. Um, and then um, just kind of that's, for me, where the magic happens. And then expanding their role. So, it's not just about fulfilling the transactions and making sure all the questions are answered. Now uh, our CX team is doing shade matching, which is such a huge component to color. And normally that's the field team and the Sephoras and whatnot are training that and doing that. But you know, there's no reason why the online experience can't be just as high touch. And we've got passionate people, two of them. <laughs> and we can, you can slide into their DMs. You know, all that sort of thing, it feels very personal and, and people come back for more. That's great. I, I think the learning for me is, you know, getting people to come back for more is like great product, right? Everyone says yeah. great product, number great one. product, number one. Uh, but once you have great product, you know, if, if somebody's not coming back for your, for your eyeliner, it's probably not that they're not using eyeliner, it's probably they found something better or cheaper mm -hmm. or different. 
Um, similar to toothpaste, right? It's like you're, you're still brushing your teeth. You just found something cheaper. I think on the on the ownership, it's always interesting to me to see the dichotomy of like founders on LinkedIn, you know, complaining about how their team is X, Y, and Z, and they're not doing it on their own, and and they you realize that they've been micromanaged, like, and and it could be their last job, and it could be the job before. Is giving people ownership is is part of understanding they might fuck up, and that's okay. Right. Right. And and. We are human, and some of our best interactions with customers are when we fuck up, and then we own up to it, you know, and it, you know, being reached out to by a brand who did you wrong in some way, real or imagined, and generally it's real, um, you know, with an apology and a fix, you know, that goes a long way, and some of our biggest, you know, people trumpeting the brand have had an experience like that, and they just feel, oh, hey, they take care of me, they know me as a person, and and value it. I'm not just a transaction to them. I love it. Uh, service, the service recovery mm -hmm. paradox. And um, it, to expand on that too, if I could, yes. it expand. It goes into the returns process even, and in all the brands that I've worked with, we almost never ask for a return back unless it's you know, um, ops needs the faulty pump or whatever it is, right? And then we'll pay for it. It's more an op opportunity to say, you know, why didn't you like this? Maybe it's an education component. Um, it's just not right for you, but maybe it is for your friend. Go ahead and share it, you know, with our compliments. If there's anything else we can do, and so it's a touch point that can really build a relationship with something with someone. With if it's not the right shade, okay, that's one way of fixing. If it's just completely not the right product, well, maybe there's something else. And if you're done, well, at least we know that, and we can shake your hand and goodbye. You know, it's not a it, not doesn't everything end, is a win. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't end weirdly. Uh, I think returns is, is actually massively under-leveraged in, mm -hmm. in a way of getting a new customer, right? It's like the cheapest. Right. You already paid for this customer. Now you can get another one. Um, and if they don't leave with a miserable experience, you're kind of uh, you're And they place. told their family and friends or whatever. It's like, and then someone says, well, I want to try that. Yeah. Well, they didn't like that. My friend didn't <laughs> like that product, but maybe I will, you know. Yeah. You never know. So. Yeah. I, it's an uh, opportunity. The... You know, we talk about retention. It's very often email, SMS, uh, sprinkle direct mail. Uh, how do you think about this? The the kind of like the soft the soft parts of retention, like the unboxing, the the shipping, the mm -hmm. kind of the the softer the softer side. That's always been really important. Um, I, I don't know if anyone in this room has ever ordered from DrunkElephant.com back in the day, and that unboxing experience with the baby blue box, and you open up to these wild colors. I mean, you know people that so much content has been created around just those boxes and that was our uh, creative director just doodled one day really and uh, even then with say you know the lilac box the signature color opening it up and you've got what is this a packet of cotton balls oh how interesting where's the packing material oh that's it and i can use this oh i get it it's the message right so um making that entire experience feel very I mean, it's, you know, we say this ad nauseum, very branded, but what is the specific thing, the <laughs> element of your branding, besides the colors or whatnot, that uh, says this is a say unboxing or a drunk elephant unboxing or whatnot, so. I love it. Um, what, uh, I guess, like one or two more questions from me, and then we'll open up to see if we have any questions in the audience. Uh, when, when you think about, you know, loyalty, I think, you know, loyalty programs mm -hmm. is kind of like just, uh, I think one of the one of the mistakes in the industry that just like spinning up a loyalty program will suddenly make you an insane amount of money. How do you think about cultivating loyalty, whether it's with a program, without a program? Mm -hmm. it, it's definitely unique to the individual company, and it has to be part of the DNA. I think, you know, unless you're Sephora um, and have, you know, you're doing the quantity play. Um, and it, for an individual brand, you're never going to make money on your loyalty program directly. Um, it's an indirect thing. With, like with Say, it's very organic. We started, like I said, with Lainey's loyalty program, which is like her followers. Um, and they continue to be our beauty crew um, that she talks directly to and where product ideas come from still to this day. We have a more purchase-oriented loyalty program as well. And you know, that digital group is really a source for all sorts of other information. I mean, we involve them in a lot of decision making as well. Um, so that's not just a, hey, buy this and get a point and then use it on something else. It's, 
join us on this journey, you're part of us. Um, and so when I look at the metrics of the loyalty program, it's not in and of itself creating direct revenue, but I know that those customers are our most loyal that have the uh, more, the higher LTV. So. Interesting. Um, I know in prepping for this conversation, uh, you said there's a, there's a tool that you're considering uh, and you wanted to ask uh, the, the audience if they have ever heard of it or seen it or thought about this yeah, issue. Yeah, so it's this new, um, they, they're saying they're a payment provider and I'm kind of learning a little bit more about it, but um, wrapping the social aspect into the buying process directly. I wonder, and they, they've come, you know, first they were just asking me like, hey, we've heard of you in these other brand situations, what do you think of this idea? And, you know, um, would you like to be our first customer? I'm mulling it over. But it seems like a really heavy lift, so I'm curious about anyone in this audience. But um, it would be like you can create your own social, almost like a text group with your friends or even strangers if you know people, but, um, and there would be tiered benefits, so it could be discounts on our site or GWPs or whatever we want to make it. But, the more your group spends and you cross these thresholds, let's say I was the first person I spent $100 and I got a 10% discount. And then you came in, you know, you're part of my group and you spent another 200, now we hit the 20% off level. I would get that additional 10% and, and you get the full 20, right? So you can, you're incentivized to encourage your group to spend um, and come back and do it again. Um, just curious, have, I think it's an interesting idea. It also feels creepy. <laughs> so I'm just curious what anyone else thinks. <laughs> um, Avi, how, how are we doing with timing? Uh, we got like five minutes. Okay. Any, uh, I mean, we can talk all day. Uh, we can talk competitive secrets. Uh, mm -hmm. We can, yeah. Um, anyone have any questions for John? Mm, ooh, that's a good one. Um, I think number one, sticking to our guns. Um, you know, really that's Laney having this vision, and it's really a two-pronged vision, so it can get more complicated, right? It's clean beauty and sustainability, and every single fucking thing we do has to mean, be both of those, pardon my French. So that's number one. Uh, so that builds the trust, so we have the community that trusts us because we stick to our guns, and then this seems, I think it may be too obvious, but <laughs> manufacturing, you have to be available. And that's, you know, you can get, when you're in those early stages, you're worried so much about the front end of things that you can forget about the back house. And then you have that viral moment, you're out of stock. And if, you're, if that's a, a chronic situation, um, it can really damage all that work you've been doing on the first two. Um, so I think you know, that, the fundamentals from that respect. Staying in stock. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions? There you go. How do you think about differentiating yourself? And especially with a founder-led brand in this stage, this, the website, the direct website, has to play those two roles, right? So half of what we do is educate this for a consumer, and the other half is the direct consumer. So. We have to avoid confusing people. So for us, we tend to have, you know, TikTok is kind of our Sephora directional um, platform, and then Meta and Google direct more to our own website, just to kind of have a little bit of separation of church and state there. And, um, and but, but the content has to be true to the brand regardless. So um, you want to direct your content to the end result, but still make sure that it reads, say. Any other questions? When you think about client block users, how do you balance acceptance That has been the albatross around my uh, sales neck in my whole career, right? Because I'm judged on how much I'm selling, but if I do anything to damage the brand, you know. You know. So, um, great question. Um, and really what that's been for me is 
and I've been lucky in that the founders understand that and they're not criticizing me uh, too heavily on the sales side. So I have to have a plan and I have to meet that plan or exceed it. But I'm not tasked with building a plan that only like total, um, you know, promo heavy to get there, right? So uh, I've always had very few sales. Discounts are almost verboten. Um, and it has to be, um, you know, that luxury first and not devaluing the brand, if that makes sense. Okay. Thank you, oh. John. Go for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're working with Catch, um, and that's been very successful for us in that regard. Where yeah, you earn uh, a credit on each purchase, and you can come back to spend that credit. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Thank you, John. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Thanks.